I'm going right, to let uh, everyone in. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are just going to wait one more minute and then we will get started. Thank you so much for joining. A quick technical note, Harriet, uh, when Mohammed Shaib enters, could you pin him, please? Awesome. Thank you. All right, let's get started. Greetings, everyone. My name is David Sai. It's my pleasure to chair today's panel. Over the past 10 months, I've been a part of the core team that has organized this conference. In total, we've brought together more than 350 speakers from 60 different countries and territories. Our goal is to be international in scope, and I hope today's session reflects this. Our panel, as you can see, environmental peace building and seemingly intractable situations, will examine what humanitarian aid, transboundary water cooperation, the extraction and protection of natural resources, community building and climate mitigation strategies, all look like during protracted conflict. We will survey distinct cases from Myanmar, Afghanistan, Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. I wanna save time and get us started right away. Therefore, we're going to send each speaker's biography in the chat below. We invite everyone in the audience to join our speakers in considering the questions that guide this panel. How do NGOs, international organizations, and government entities operate within repressive, dysfunctional, or failed states? When is strategic intervention appropriate? How does one decide which actions to take? And what lessons from the past can inform our future efforts? What are durable solutions that combine the aims of international bodies with the means of national actors and vice versa? Finally, we're going to touch on perhaps the most important question of all, what motivates your work and why, in the face of near insurmountable challenges, do you keep going? Discussion and debate are at the center of this conference, and we would like to lay some ground rules before we start. I will state for the record that racist, anti-Semitic, derogatory, profane comments of any sort will result in you being kicked from the session and banned from future events. We are here to challenge ideas, not the people themselves. Today, as you can see, we have gathered an all-star group of experts and practitioners and academics to exchange views on conducting environmental peacebuilding activities in complex and often dangerous environments. Maria, if you could change the next slide. Thank you. I'm grateful to Maria and Harriet who are providing technical support for this session. A special thank you also to the sponsors of this conference who have helped us waive the registration fee, so there is no charge. After the emergence of Omicron, we had to pivot to an online format, thanks in no small part to the hard work of many people that went on behind the scenes. Maria, if you could end the session, please, or the end the sharing. Now, Please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Ms. Sharon Benheim, who is coming to us from Israel. Sharon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I think it's the screen is yours now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it's really been an amazing time uh, in the sessions until now, and I hope, uh, I hope we'll be able to have a good experience also in this session. Uh, you, start, you opened the session and talked about what does it take. Uh, I'm gonna hopefully convince everyone here 
that in intractable conflict situations, it takes a really long impact in order to make change. Uh, my research is about, is a retrospective study about Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israeli participants in a multicultural program at the Arva Institute for Environmental Studies. Um, what is the program? What I, what I want to know is what happens when students from these different communities that are in conflict, and not just any conflict, but a very long standing and often uh, with escalating points of, of uh, violence, what happens when they meet together in an international program that focuses on a shared interest in preserving their environment, as well as learning about the conflict? I'm looking at participants five to 25 years after they've completed the program. Most evaluation studies look at a program at the end, before and after, or maybe even a year later. There are very few studies that have done long-term evaluations about what happens. But my study is actually not an evaluation, but rather getting people's personal experiences and their retrospective perspective of what happened to them as people in this region. So is the Aravad program any different than other, other programs? There's a large body of information about dialogues and encounters between Israelis and Palestinians. Many of them are weekly sessions or maybe uh, over the course of either a semester or a year or maybe short intensive programs such as a summer camp. Some are within the region, many are taking people out of the region. And this program brings people together for a full semester or year long full-time residential program where they live in dormitories on a tiny kibbutz isolated in the middle of the Arava Desert, which is in the south of Israel, close to the Gulf of Aqaba. They live together, eat together in a communal dining room, participate in courses and extracurricular activities, and they're really uh, ex intensely exposed one to another. Um, they also have study trips, sorry, uh, where they travel throughout the region and listen to people about the work that they're doing uh, on environmental issues and cooperative uh, peace building issues. I don't think I'm gonna read this whole slide because we don't really have time, but uh, basically um, the program consists of university coursework, field trips, and a kind of envelope program, which is a facilitated dialogue session every week in which students first get to know each other, each other's culture and background, the societies that they come from. And then uh, um, all of that together uh, makes up the experience. Uh, this is a quote from a student. All in all, I still think that with all the triggers and with all the complexity and with everything, it was an amazing experience and I would never, ever, ever take it back, ever. Similar statements were very common in my pilot interviews, and they've been found to be nearly universal in previous research about alumni, which was also done a number of years after their participation in the program. Uh, therefore, I thought that we needed more research to really get at the heart of what impact the program might have had on these students. Um, I'm using mixed methods, primarily interviews, which of course in the COVID era have shifted to Zoom. Um, I am not fluent in Arabic. I am fluent in English and Hebrew. And so I have given the students their choice of those two languages. Of course, they're all fluent enough in English to complete a university level program there. Uh, and I'm using some uh, questionnaire measures uh, to check about empathy, legitimization of the other's narrative, levels of trust, willingness to reconcile, and potentially also a new measure I just discovered during my research of environmental identity. Um, one of the aspects of the Arva Institute is when you're done with the program, you're not actually done. They joke about it being the uh, Hotel California for those of you who know the Eagles song. You can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. There are uh, alumni activities in the region locally for groups that live near each other. So for example, in Jerusalem or in Amman, in Aqaba a, and so on. But uh, there are also alumni conferences. I also wanna take a moment and say, international students take part in this program because it's taught in English, it's very popular 
with North Americans, but also people from Europe and South America have participated and even Japan or other uh, more far-flung regions. However, my research is focusing only on those participants who grew up in the Middle East and still make their home in the Middle East today. So they may have been out of the region, gone to academic studies somewhere else, graduate school, or worked for a short period outside the region, but I'm only really focusing on people who both grew up here and settled here as adults. Um, so far, the interviews I've done reveals a really complex picture uh, of a real sense of despair. And I think that's something that is expected in some ways in an intractable conflict. Things are not getting better. The big picture is not getting better. Um, and the positive feelings that people had during the program as they built trust and built personal relationships and worked on projects together and made things better in the activities that they were doing has not so easily has not been so easy to transfer when they returned home. And yet in every interview, the interviewees are expressing hope and conviction that they have to continue to try in spite of that. Uh, so let's just review the big points. This is a really rare chance to meet in the region. When the students are interviewed for their admissions pr procedure for the program, it is often the very first time that they speak to someone from the other community. So the first time a Jordanian meets a Jewish Israeli or a Palestinian meets a Jewish Israeli or a Jewish Israeli meets a Palestinian uh, who conducts their interview. Um, they get to see specific issues firsthand on those trips. They have to delve into the issue of living together and their relationships on campus. They also continue to work together to solve specific environmental challenges as part of the alumni network the program also is one of skills building where you are learning new material and learning new techniques. Uh, and it has the added value for the Middle Eastern students of really helping them work on their English, their ability to present and to interact with international uh, um, groups of people uh, goes way up in this program. Um, there are a lot of things that we share. One of them is the fact that uh, nature knows no boundaries. The birds don't have passports. Uh, the water doesn't stop at the border. And the truth is that as I'm teasing out themes from what the alumni are saying, uh, we're, we're finding that there are two categories, primarily people who have dedicated their career to the field of environmental peace building in this region and those who have gone on to other careers, uh, mostly out of financial pressures to make everything possible for their families as they settle down and, and start having children, but continue to look for ways to be engaged in the work uh, outside of their regular work day. Thank you very much. Jerome, that was fascinating. Um, a quick question on your personal background. Would you say that you fall in the category of someone who's been dedicated to the academic field of environmental peace building for quite some time or someone that has gone off pursued other ends and then come back because i know at present you're pursuing your uh your phd right now um at bangor university so if you could touch on that please so my personal background uh started with studies in psychology uh evolved into environmental and ecological, ecological psychology. And then uh, even then was an active member of Greenpeace and that sort of thing at that time, that was what there was. Uh, so I'd say since the eighties, I have been involved in a variety of ways of approaching both the issues of environment and peace building, but they were not uh, synthesized the way they are today. And the fact that I was able to work in the program uh, at the Arava Institute for 17 years gave me a lot of insight into how connected those, those two fields that I feel very personally connected to really are. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> that does, thank you. Um, please allow me to turn now uh, to Ms. Elizabeth Hassami. Uh, she'll be joining us from Washington, DC. Okay. 
Thank you, David. And thank you to um, all the um, NPAC members helping us out today. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to say before I get started, um, I had a very long term relationship with Afghanistan. At 17, I happened to be in Uzbekistan when the Soviets were um, withdrawing from Afghanistan. So, and I remember seeing flying over Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan seeing the Soviet convoys leaving. And that sparked a lifetime interest. Um, so this picture, I think just um, from my friend, Matt Carson, who's a travel blogger, um, is such a, a great look at the beauty of Afghanistan. It's incredibly beautiful. And often in the media, we really only see very negative um, and, and awful pictures of such a beautiful place. So um, last year I had a consulting position. I was consulting on Afghanistan and peace building. And um, I had the chance to speak to about 15 or 20 experts around the globe on Afghanistan, natural resources. So a lot of my ideas for this came kind of out of that position. So um, to just get started, I wanna look at um, for this whole, um, uh, presentation, um, harnessing natural resources as entry points for dialogue, because there is a potential catastrophe happening in Afghanistan. And I'm sure anybody on this, um, hopefully anybody on this panel um, has heard of what's happening in terms of famine. Oh, we can go to the next slide, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, what's happening. Um, but here's just a little roadmap about what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I want to look at um, issues of food insecurity and economic collapse. Just obviously, these are all very quickly. Um, water insecurity um, and how technical assistance could possibly be a point of entry for dialogue with uh, the Taliban, who's or who's ever con in control of whichever region, which is most likely right now the Taliban, um, which is the government um, at this point. <laughs> um, Landmines are still a huge issue in Afghanistan, um, and so a point of entry for dialogue might be technical assistance there. And I'm not talking about U.S. dialogue, obviously. I'm talking about possibly neutral humanitarian organizations, a lot of times under the U.N. or other um, umbrellas. Uh, deforestation is also a huge issue. Um, so um, maybe let's just go to the next slide. Okay, but I wanted to do a quick update on what's happening right now. Obviously, um, the Taliban seized power and consolidated it in August of last year. And the humanitarian crisis has just accelerated since then. Um, famine and drought are probably the two primary concerns, um, but there's many, many other environmental issues. As I mentioned, landmine contamination, deforestation, and many others. So you might be wondering why in the world are we talking to the Taliban? Well, whether we like it or not, whether they are recognized or not, they are under international law, the government at this point, they control the territory. Um, and so um, that's the situation. <laughs> now, I'm not saying the dialogue should legitimize the Taliban, but humanitarian, neutral, independent organizations need to be able to dialogue in order to save lives in Afghanistan. And they already are. Um, for example, you know, the food and FAO, UNFAO, um, are already there and helping. So um, when I spoke with all the experts last year, they all said natural resources can really be a, a common interest to begin dialogue when any other topic might be problematic and difficult. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to use one of the quotes from one of the experts I spoke with. Um, and he said, and of course he said that um, Forests and trees, for, for some reason, were some of the best and most useful tools to start dialogues between hostile parties. And he said, we've consistently seen in various places how the environment will be used, can be used as a bridge when nothing else can be discussed. Um, usually, he said, and he was saying this, at least his organization, which is uh, a, a neutral organization, at least we can talk about you know soccer or football and the environment, if nothing else. And he said, in the case of Afghanistan, it may only be the environment. And he was in Afghanistan for many, many years. Uh, next slide. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the um, food insecurity because it's the most um, pressing issue, I would say. Right now you have 22.8 million estimated Afghans experiencing extreme levels of hunger by the end of the year. There is just a surge in severe acute malnutrition amongst children, which is just devastating and heartbreaking. 70% um, of the Afghan population lives in rural area and 85% depend on agriculture for their livelihood. And the picture is um, a common um, 
when it's dried, I believe it's called toot. Well, we call it toot. I think it's a mulberry um, that most Afghans enjoy as a snack. Um, but um, I'll go to the next slide. So we need to help Afghanistan avoid a, a hunger trap. Millions of Afghans are living on the edge of a major catastrophe, which will occur if their animals die or fields go unplanted. And that's from FAO director. Um, and the photo is actually a photo from one of, um, well, the previous Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation and Livestock in Kabul. And I don't know what, honestly what the um, uh, current situation is with the ministry because I am not in contact with anybody there anymore. Um, sadly, I used to have um, uh, many relatives and friends who work there, but I don't, um, I don't talk to anybody right now. Okay, so next, next slide. So a point of entry for dialogue could be technical assistance with agriculture. Um, and that, that can be helped with livestock care, feed, de feeding, deworming. Um, and that is crucial to maintain households dairy um, production. And that's just critical for families. Um, with seed distribution, which is critical for farmers, this is an interesting um, area because I spoke with one of the people I interviewed um, was an FAO, um, actually he'd been the FAO for probably 40 years. So he was in Afghanistan in the late nineties under the first iteration of the Taliban. And so he remembered when um, seed development was being done and he was in, in charge of some of that. And um, they actually were able to, of course you never want to um, condition food aid when there's hungry people. But when talking about technical seed aid there was some negotiation on, okay, um, uh, we might do this and there may be the local commander, Taliban commanders were willing to maybe ease up on certain things, human rights issues. So, but that was of course not immediate need. That was not immediate food aid or anything like that. So I would never want to say that. Um, but doing nothing will cause display, further displacement in rural areas. Um, and this is a great uh, quote from Richard Trenchard at, at the FAO. Um, no farmer wants to leave their land. But when you have no food, you have no grain from the previous harvest, there are no seeds in the field and livestock are gone, you have no choice. So um, obviously um, food insecurity is a big driver of uh, you know, migration. Um, uh, next slide. And the next slide is um, water insecurity, which is also a huge problem in Afghanistan. There's drought in 25 of 34 provinces, 700,000 people were made um, uh, internally displaced persons, IDPs, due to drought in 2021. Climate change is just exacerbating the situation. Only, and this is, these stats are from, um, oh, can we go back? <laughs> these stats are from 2021. Only 42% of Afghans can access safe drinking water at this point. And only 27% of rural populations have appropriate and um, safe sanitation facilities. That's from USAID. Um, sanitation assistance is critical in Afghanistan. Diarrhea is the second most common cause of death for children under the age of five. And that was from a WASH consultant that I interviewed. Um, okay, now we can move ahead. So a point of entry for dialogue might be technical assistance with water and with water quality and water filtration and testing for sanitation. Um, this is just critical. Um, and so on the picture here, there is a solar um, uh, water tank and they actually have um, pens that can filter water that are solar, um, improving access to uh, rehab of water catchments and irrigation systems. Some of the irrigation systems are, are quite ancient. Many were extremely um, damaged by the Soviets and have never been, um, repair. So we're talking about damage 40 years ago um, that needs repair. Um, and the Karees, the underground canal systems really need help. So there's a lot of work to be done. And, um, and those are all points of entry for dialogue. Uh, next slide. So one of the most heartbreaking um, situations in Afghanistan is the prevalence of landmines. It's one of the most heavily uh, mined countries on earth. Um, the the landmines to the uh, right on of the slide are Soviet-made butterfly mines, which many people may have heard of. These were intentionally made to look like toys, and um, because if a child um, 
uh, picked them up and was injured, obviously that would make it less likely that the family was able to, um, to resist the Soviet occupation. So, um, and this is a huge problem because really good arable land in Afghanistan that could be used for agriculture and growing crops is left unused, even if it's rumored to have landmines. Obviously, everyone's too scared to go on it. Um, and so this is just a huge issue. Um, and also landmines leak, leak uh, toxic chemicals into the land, and that's just terrible. Um, so next slide. So yeah, so this is a great point of entry for, for a dialogue, I think, um, because it's expensive and it's technically very difficult to remove even one mine. Um, it's about a thousand USD um, to, uh, to find and remove one landmine. That's, that's a lot. Um, and the Taliban have made it clear they are asking for help locating and removing explosives. Many of them they have just recently laid. So I, I think that they're done laying them and now they want help removing them. And of course that benefits all Afghans to get them out, whether they were laid by the Soviets or in the civil war in the early nineties or just recently by the Taliban or by ISK. So they need a lot of help removing um, them. And there's some really interesting technology using drones and thermal imaging to find certain types of um, landmines. So that's, that's been really encouraging in a, in a very dismal uh, new cycle in Afghanistan. Um, and the Taliban has said that they do declare now landmines to be un-Islamic and that they won't use them anymore. The problem is though, neighbors use mines along border areas, which is a big problem. Um, but international assistance is desperately needed to remove them, to find them and remove them using the, the latest technology. And th there's a need for Taliban political will to, to do this, um, no question. Next slide. Ah, okay, so this is uh, the deforestation. And this is actually a picture of the Kabul Greenbelt project, which was started, I think around 2016 to reforest areas around Kabul. And um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to hear if any, if they've been able to continue the project. But deforestation, of course, began um, during the Soviet occupation in the 80s. It continued and accelerated for many reasons up to probably the current day. Combat, uh, criminal timber smuggling operations, um, and indirect causes such as displaced populations just trying to stay warm have caused the decimation of the majority of Afghan forests. Um, many areas around Kabul remain deforested. Some of them were replanted under the, project, the Kabul Green, uh, Greenbelt project. Um, but what's happening now, um, I, I have no idea, but I think that's gonna be an area that could be an opening for dialogue for sure, because um, uh, bringing back the forest has a lot of benefits, not just obviously the beauty, but um, it prevents flash flooding and things like that um, and stabilizes the, uh, the ground. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so again, reforestation has been a focus of many organizations over the past two decades, and it needs to continue. Um, for example, pistachios can, uh, if you replant pistachios, it can not only provide livelihoods, but they again um, offer some protection against flash flooding. Uh, reforestation can also restore dignity and beauty for Afghans in areas where the, the environment's just been devastated due to uh, a 40 year conflict. Uh, next year, ne next um, slide. So some conclusions, Afghanistan is facing multiple catastrophes, um, economic and banking collapse, famine, drought, landmines, deforestation, and more. Um, there is just a desperate need for the expansion of aid and technical support imperative to avoid famine and to re help rebuild critical um, ag sectors. And I think natural resources really could provide meaningful entry points for dialogue in challenging areas in particular. Um, I understand that dialogue with the Taliban is often controversial to talk about, but it's necessary to help starving Af Afghans who could starve to death, um, uh, which is just devastating. And so obviously continued aid packages are needed and, and technical support. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Elizabeth, that's a very sobering um, picture of the reality right now. And I thank you for just that in-depth presentation. Um, it's a, a real wake up call that the small state that I'm currently living in, the United States has a population of 3.5 million. And you said in the presentation that around 22 million Afghans are suffering from 
extreme um, are, are, at, are at risk of uh, extreme famine. I think that's mm -hmm. a very, it's a very, it's a very sobering picture. One question I had, and you touched on this, is that if we are to talk about the relationship between technical aid, like mm -hmm. seed sharing, you said, mm -hmm. um, versus all out um, financial support from international organizations or from financing bodies, um, where do we draw the line if the Taliban government is here to stay? Um, are there concessions that you make on human rights or is that a, a firm line in the sand that you do not cross? I think it's a really tough question, David, honestly. And the gentleman from FAO that I spoke with um, who actually negotiated with the Taliban in the late 90s over, and that was specifically over education of girls in some of the central provinces um, in exchange for further seed, te technical seed development. Um, and it was quite an, a lengthy process. Um, and I think that in that case, it was limited to helping seed development and agriculture, which was an immediate need, not as immediate as perhaps say food, direct food aid, but it was really necessary to get people um, back on their feet. So um, I think it's it's very delicate process. And you bring up a great point that this conference um, has been trying trying to emphasize is that throughout all of these conflicts, there is a very important piece and that is gender equality. And mm -hmm. with the stat you said that 70% of those killed in Afghanistan by mines were children. Mm -hmm. um, it's, again, I go back to this point, it's, it's a really big wake up call for, for academics and practitioners who may be on this session that um, their work is incredibly valuable to, to, saving, to saving real lives and to making real change. Um, I'm sure there are people in the session that have questions after that and we'll come back around to it. Um, oh, just thank David, you, Elizabeth. Just to, just to yep. correct you on something, it was the 70% was the 70% of Afghan populations live in rural areas, not that 70% of um, landmine victims are children, but many, many landmine victims of those particular bombs are children. I just wanted to just clarify that. No, thank you. Sorry. Sorry for misspeaking. Um, Dr. Kyungmi Kim, we can now turn to you. Thank you uh, for waiting patiently. You have the floor. Thanks so much, everyone. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to some of you. So let me try to share my screen. Um, Yeah, so uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel. And it's uh, it's my pleasure to uh, speak about this uh, conservation project in the conflict area in Myanmar. It's a project is called the Sawin Peace Park. So I will start with a, a bit of a context, how this uh, case and how this uh, community led environmental uh, conservation and a conservation effort fits into the general environmental peace building uh, uh, discussion. And then I will uh, yeah, delve into the case study. So yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm now a researcher at uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute uh, working on climate change and risk. So yeah, now I'm uh, working also on the Middle East. So yeah, I really uh, also appreciated the a presentation by Sharon and yeah, the situation in Afghanistan is very interesting and yeah, it's uh, it's also very good to hear um, Elizabeth's presentation. So yeah, I'll begin now. Yeah, so um, so my interest here is to uh, look at how environmental conservation can can work uh, in the context of armed conflict, which I define a little bit broader than the conventional uh, definition. So I also look at situations where the not only there is a certain threshold of a battle death, but also uh, looking at the situations where there has been a long uh, protracted conflict as well, which uh, Myanmar fits into. And uh, I would like to explore how the case of the Salwin Peace Park project in Myanmar's current state um, can speak for some of the this valuable lessons that how communities can lead and also implement uh, efforts to uh, protect forest and also valuable species. Yeah, so in that uh, focus, I would like to uh, highlight how uh, local civil society actors, uh, they 
uh, mobilize community and also negotiate access with uh, key political actors. In this case, that's a, a rebel group uh, that represents uh, Karen uh, ethnic people in Myanmar. And then I would like to speak briefly about uh, how that this post coup violence um, after the February 1, 2021, uh, when the Myanmar military uh, took over the uh, power from the democratically elected civilian government. And then that uh, uh, violence also deeply affected the Salon Peace Park project. And this, I think, really illustrates the challenges of environmental conservation in uh, this very uh, contentious, complex situation. Yeah, so I think this has been already uh, much discussed in other sessions during the conference as well, how the conservation efforts are ongoing in complex situations. And, and of course the conservation, uh, of course the violent conflict affects um, uh, wildlife and also it, it's, it, it leads to habitat loss. So I think a lot of the cases show that armed conflict has negative impact on, on the environment and leads to the environmental degradation. And also the uh, conflict outcomes, such as the refugee um, influx and the population movement due to the violence, it can really cause the environment to, um, to deteriorate in, in many situations. I think the DRC's uh, Kivu area is really a good example where the refugees moved into a national park and it really uh, damaged the forest there. And of course, this is not the intentional uh, intention of the conflict, but I think this is just an inevitable consequence, uh, one of the consequences of uh, armed conflict. Uh, so in some cases, but also you can see that, uh, like in Myanmar, the, when the conflict is going on for a long period, uh, then the development projects uh, are hindered from certain areas. That means that the um, certain areas can be shielded uh, from development and can be um, protected from the uh, large scale uh, extractions of resources. But of course, the um, also Myanmar's protected forest or the deep forest were, was also heavily exploited by some of the armed actors. So it's it doesn't work for all species, but for certain species, they can also be protected by the armed conflict because of the less development activities. So uh, when you look at the how um, the, the efforts to protect the environment um, can actually benefit the population who are living in the conflict situations. I think it's, there, is a, in, there is a tremendous potential there that we can also promote their livelihood improvements and also to protect the ecosystem that's uh, valuable and they remain uh, for the rest of the humanities for, for the yeah, for the <laughs> for the good of good of the human beings. Uh, yeah, so I think these conservation issues are quite complicated uh, due to the uh, can be complicated due to the conflict. And I would like to also bring your attention to uh, civil society in conservation work. So I think we often look at the transnational conservation actors when we look at um, conservation projects like the IUCN and WWF, and I think they do a great job on uh, equip, uh, equipping the uh, uh, local actors, governments, and also sometimes the communities to uh, gain proper knowledge about uh, the conservation, and they also provide tools and also finances sometimes. So I think they're really, really valuable actors, but I think we, um, I think there is also study on this local civil society, like the community-based uh, organizations or this nationally connected uh, domestic, the, 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 the country organizations. So, so I think there are, there are different kinds of civil society that we uh, have uh, looked at in the research. And I think there, is a, there needs to be more uh, focus on this local community-based I really the grounded local civil society. I think they, I think understanding these actors can be a key to promote conservation in complex situations. So uh, there, so I have looked at some of the cases of this uh, to develop this paper. That the, so I have um, seen some uh, cases of how the communities co-manage fisheries, co-manage uh, uh, forest also community land and also sometimes uh, there is also one case in Myanmar they have a 
community uh, managed lakes, so uh, a lake. So that's uh, that's very uh, interesting how they establish rules um, and then try to govern uh, the commons with the with the this customary and also the the locally agreed um, sanctioned uh, rules. But there is also um, some research on the effectiveness is higher in this case, but there is also um, significant limitation uh, can, can exist in, in terms of the resources and also the technical limitations. They may not have the access uh, from the transnational actors and also local politics can, um, can hinder the uh, effective implementation of these projects. And also it, it is difficult to uh, um, subject these local actors with the international standard. Um, so there is a bit of a lack of um, uh, quality control and also there could be a lack of accountability of these local actors. So yeah, uh, let me bring you to the southeastern part of Myanmar. So Myanmar has a 50 million population and it's a country in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's a, it is a beautiful country and the, the Saolin Peace Park is located uh, along the Thai-Myanmar border. So it's a yeah. So it is located in a in a current state. So current state has a population of sub, something about one point five million, but the, this border area is very sparsely populated. But the people do uh, live along the forest uh, near the border. So this Salin Peace Park uh, covers about five thousand four hundred kilom uh, square kilometers. And it has about 7,000 inhabitants, uh, 70,000 inhabitants, uh, people living inside the park. And uh, it also contains a uh, regional, uh, so, so this is a regional, uh, regional diversity hotspot, and it has like uh, several uh, community uh, forest, uh, wildlife sanctuaries, and also uh, reserve forest areas. And it also designates co uh, customary land area. And that they try, they try to provide um, uh, access to land through this um, uh, mapping of the uh, Peace Park area. So this area is also notably um, under a strong influence or under control of the current national union. It's an ethno-nationalist uh, uh, rebel group. Uh, they uh, started their rebellion in 19. 49, so that was uh, almost at the birth of the Myanmar's, uh, <laughs> Myanmar as a country uh, being independent from Britain. And that they were, um, they signed the ceasefire in 2011. Uh, that's a bilateral ceasefire and that they also um, had a, a party to the national uh, ceasefire agreement uh, with the government. So they uh, became a, a bit of a, uh, central actor in politics during the political opening era, but the, uh, the ceasefire has uh, effectively uh, collapsed in, uh, in March 2021 after the coup. So, so this Peace Park project was uh, in, well, in, a, in an essence, uh, it, it was a very uh, opportune moment for the for the activists who wanted to create this area as a refuge for the Karen ethnic people. Plus they wanted to also protect the ecosystem and the environment. They wanted to uh, protect the land access of the communities. So I think all this interest uh, led to the creation of this park. And also that was possible because um, it was during the ceasefire era. So the creation of the park uh, was, at, was in 2019. And the, this Peace Park uh, Charter, you can see in the photo, uh, it's also available online. You can have a look at it if you're interested. So it's, uh, it was uh, agreed by the communities um, living in the park. So they have a delegation who, um, who, uh, yeah, who came and who, 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 who voted and the very high uh, turnout uh, said to uh, have agreed to, agreed to this park to be established. And they have uh, this rules of, uh, co-management that's uh, that's codified in the in the charter so this also charter uh, notably state their right to self-determination and also peace building which is very interesting because um of course the this uh part project is a this tripartite cooperation so this the uh, current ethnic conservation group so this environmental activists 
and then the Korean community, so Korean people, and then the Korean uh, ethno-nationalist rebel group is also a very core uh, party to this project. So this is a tripartite uh, cooperation between the people, environmental activists, and also the their political authority slash uh, people can also use um, yeah, violence. So that's that's a very uh, I think this is probably quite unique situation. Um, but yeah, so I think because of this unique um, combination of actors, they I think also have a very strong uh, tendency to speak about the park as a uh, expression of the self determination, which is uh, very interesting. Yes, yeah, so another. Um, I guess it's a, this aspect of this park is that uh, this also was seen by the community to uh, protect their rights to the land that they were living. So these people were repeatedly uh, displaced by the conflict uh, over uh, 40 to uh, uh, over about 40 years. So this area has under uh, heavy fire by the uh, Myanmar military, and the yeah this uh, this caused the population within this park area to uh, displace from the one place to another. And the, a lot of the people who live in the park, also the, the, the older generation, they uh, come from the central Myanmar. So they were repeatedly displaced population. So it's it's in a, in a way, it's very fascinating that they could uh, preserve their culture, their uh, material connection to the land. So at this, uh, in this park area, so it, it does have uh, this ideological component as well as the very uh, strong material um, uh, preference by the yeah by the people and the environmental activists and also the current um, national union to uh, uh, support this initiative. So I have to be very brief because I have two minutes left. Um, so after uh, the Myanmar military took the power, so I thought it was very interesting when Elizabeth was saying about the Taliban. Uh, controlling the country, but not a government. So this is a bit of an opposite situation. It is a government, but does not really govern. Uh, so, so due to the coup, um, yeah, so Myanmar military has really uh, lost uh, its legitimacy. It also lost a lot of, the, the government itself has lost power to uh, actually govern the country and many, many parts of uh, Myanmar. So this uh, southeastern part is uh, one of the areas, uh, yeah, that has um, that that was not also controlled by the military uh, previously before the coup. But I mean, it's it's after the coup, this area has actually become a, a, a humanitarian uh, disaster zone, which is very unfortunate. But I also understand that the. Salvin Peace Park team is working hard to uh, continue the conservation work. But the most uh, uh, traumatic and devastating event was uh, happening during March and April 2021, when the 27 airstrikes uh, were, was carried out in the area of uh, Salvin Peace Park. And it destroyed several schools and many houses. And also it displaced um, uh, tens of thousands of people. Here I wrote 10,000, but I think the numbers, uh, yeah, the estimations vary. I think the higher estimation is uh, twenty to thirty thousand. So, you can you can imagine like half of the population in the park uh, had to leave their homes and villages, and had to, some of them had to uh, cross the river to Thailand, and then uh, they were also kicked out from Thailand. So they were, they were moved back to Myanmar. So a lot of them are internally displaced people at the moment. And after the airstrikes, uh, now the, the ground troops are also uh, operating in the area. So the area has become an active conflict zone. Yeah, so this is a very precarious situation and the conservation work. Um, I understand from my contacts that they try to uh, continue the work by uh, using the camera traps and they also try to uh, in the, still uh, enforce the rules among the communities remain, but I think the future is uh, quite precarious, we can say. So just briefly um, conclude. So the cooperation between local actors, uh, and also this, uh, so I forgot to mention that the, some of the transnational uh, conservation actors, uh, they did contribute to the uh, technical aspects of this uh, initiative. So they did uh, also have a support uh, 
in this uh, project. So I think the, this, this local and also transnational uh, cooperation is an important aspect. And also the, the field of environmental peace building, uh, I think it can really uh, deeply look at this uh, conservation and conflict situations. I think it can, I think the, the case from Myanmar, it also adds um, you know, another uh, level of uh, complexity. I mean, of course, that there is already existing study by Kevin Woods and also there's a new uh, special issue in political geography recently. So I think there is also a uh, high interest here. Um, and also the this, uh, yeah, changing political dynamics, uh, conflict dynamics, I think it brings uh, very immense challenges to locally driven conservation work. And I, But I don't think this is the reason why we should, should not look at uh, the community-led conservation efforts in also different contexts that we should continue uh, our attention here. Yeah, okay, thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, yeah, please let me know. Thank you, Dr. Kim. <clears throat> thank you for that presentation. Um, Myanmar's history as a whole, uh, since they gained independence in 48, has been one of turmoil. Um, and the cycle of illegitimate military illegitimate governments and military juntas and coups um, throughout their history is, is, is something that, that we must analyze. And I think you draw a really interesting point um, to Elizabeth's analysis of Afghanistan. Um, I think I'd just like to invite uh, Elizabeth to, to respond to your presentation um, because the, the recent military coup from February, 2021, um, has definitely has definitely shaped the country similar to what happened August 2021 in Afghanistan. So Elizabeth, please, if you have any comments. Sure, I just wanted to just um, reiterate that the Taliban is, is, is the government of, of Afghanistan. They are governing, they have control of the entire territory. I, I just wanna make sure that everyone understood that I, if there was any confusion. Um, and under international law, from what I understand, um, even though they are not recognized at this point, um, they are they are in control, so they are the government, um, and um, it, it's an interesting situation because they um, they did take it by force in some ways because of the protracted conflict for so many years. But in another sense, the former government just left, um, and they did not even maintain a constitutional claim on the government. Like when in the late nineties, um, Rabani, when he left, fled Afghanistan, maintained a constitutional claim. So when the Taliban came in. Um, there was still a claim by somebody else, which is under international law, apparently. Um, there are some issues with that as far as does, is there another group with a claim to the government? When Ghani left Afghanistan, he did not maintain a constitutional claim. So at this point, they are in control. There's no other claim. And so um, whether you like it or not, and many of us, you know, are um, concerned, but um, they are at this point, the government. So I just wanted to clarify that. I wasn't saying they weren't the government. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Kim, one question I had for you is that since uh, the Tamadaw military took control in February 2021, there's been estimates that like 1,500 people have been killed um, by the Tamadaw. And I'm wondering, what is the relationship between the Karen National Union, the, the Karen Conservation Group, and the Tamadaw vis-a-vis um, -vis the Salween Peace Park? Um, is conservation efforts, are they being hindered? Um, in Myanmar right now, um, are the Tatmada and the Karen Conservation Group fighting? Uh, just some some insight, I think, would be really appreciated. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, thanks for so. Uh, yeah, to just raise that the humanitarian toll and also the the people, the number of people who are who have been killed uh, since the coup. I think it's yeah. I think this uh, is a devastating for many. Uh, many of us who've been studying Myanmar for years, and and uh, yeah, so yeah, of course I, I just want to also express that uh, yeah, it's uh, it's of course very upsetting, and 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 a lot of good uh, development and also the conservation work and and the peace building work done in the country. Um, I think um, I I don't want to say that that the effort was for nothing. But I think that that did change the country and that that's why we saw the revolution in last February. But yeah, just just for uh, yeah, flagging the that the link between the violence and and the and the Salween Peace Park. Uh, so so the 
I, I forgot to mention during my presentation that the Salvin Peace Park uh, project did not engage the government. The, the, the government of Myanmar, the country has the for, uh, Ministry of Forestry and, and the conservation, uh, the environmental conservation, but these ministries were not um, part of this project. And, and the, just, so I, when I spoke to the uh, activists who, uh, who worked on this uh, project in 2017 and 2018, they, their reasons was that because they can do it themselves, they don't need the government to be on board, uh, which kind of suggests that the, so, so in the country uh, of such size and also the this decentralized governance in, 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 in some ways that the country is, is, is quite uh, geographically quite big and, and the, the Southeast um, Myanmar, uh, the, the influence of the KNU is very strong. So the Myanmar government does not have um, underground control. So they have the government offices, but they don't have uh, the legitimacy. They don't have the underground control. So after the coup, the, the many uh, areas that's not uh, major, uh, that's not uh, populated by the majority uh, Burmese ethnic people, I think a lot of these areas rebelled against the state because that's the kind of uh, conflict dynamics that we've been seeing in Myanmar since its independence. So the Salmin Peace Park project was in a way, even during the democratically elected government era, it, was, uh, it existed outside of the state sphere. But it was, um, yeah, I, I have never heard any government official talking about the Salmin Peace Park, but what I understood is that the, they, they were uh, allowed to exist because they had a ceasefire and KNU had a control of the area. But now the area has become a contested area. So the Tapadao is fighting the KNU actively in the area to take the territory. So right now, the of course, the territorial control by the KNU is a, one of the essential necessary condition for the park to exist. So I think, uh, in my opinion, it's, uh, yeah, it is a challenging situation, but of course the Tapada is not very good at uh, fighting the ethnic minority army. So we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, that was a really insightful answer. I invite everyone uh, in this session to, to use the chat function. There's a fantastic conversation going on there. Um, we'll swing back around after uh, Mr. Yeager Scott gives a presentation to Q&A to some of these questions. Um, Anders, I'd like to turn it over to you. Dr. Kim, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. And thank you, Elizabeth Chan and, and, and Kyung Mi. Uh, fascinating presentation. So, so I've been asked to, to uh, reflect a little bit uh, on uh, the presentations, but also give uh, a few perspectives uh, on my own. So I'm, I'm going to start by reflecting uh, a little bit on the presentations before moving into uh, what is uh, sort of my, my area, which is transboundary waters. And I'll dig uh, deeper into some of those aspects. Where, and there are some connections, not least to, to what, what Sharon was talking about. But, 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 but some of the things that, that I sort of take with me, having listened to all of your, your presentations, which are different and really uh, speaks to the importance of, of understanding the specific context, uh, uh, and 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 I, I couldn't emphasize that more. I, it was also highlighted in one of the earlier sessions that you know you can't take something that 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 seems to be working in one part and then moving it without really adjusting it to the specific context um, that you're in. So I think that's that's one of the, the the things that I think come come through. However, that being said, um, there are, uh, you know, a, a few threads that, that I think are, are, are similar. Uh, I think it, all the presentations in different ways speaks to sort of the, 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 the challenges of environmental peacemaking, if you like. Uh, I think Kyung Mi's um, presentation, you know, talking about the Salween Peace Park, you know, also shows the, 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 the challenges and the vulnerability because it was seemingly being established and then um, almost overnight, uh, it's, uh, everything is sort of pulled from, from underneath. 
uh, in that in that respect. So it speaks to the vulnerabilities and the, and, and the sort of in a way the limitations of of uh, of this approach. And it seems to me, um, but that's perhaps a question that, that you know I'll I'll put back to to uh, the 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 panelists as well. Um, that that to some degree the the sort of environmental peacemaking and the, and the use of the environment um whether it's in in a nation or, or between nations needs to uh, to be sort of further entrenched institutionalized up to at least a certain level um to get as so so strong that it actually uh that it actually becomes harder than what it what it was in in the case of myanmar to sort of um, be not reversed fully, but part, but 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 almost. Uh, you get the sense of uh, overnight. So so you know some reflections on that. That's that's something that I'd like to to uh, uh, to invite and, and uh, the the colleagues to to think about. Also, sort of the looking at uh, perhaps uh, also uh, the Afghanistan presentation by by Elizabeth, and it's it's fascinating. And and uh, I know Elizabeth has, has deep insight, so uh, you know really beneficial to hear. Here uh, uh, about that, but sort of the messiness that 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 um, one um, uh, is 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 in when when you have this conflict situation with with uh, so many millions uh, at the brink of of uh, being food insecure. They are already food insecure, and it's it's just going to uh, continue unless humanitarian aid comes in. So so sort of the messiness um, where. Humanitarian actors, but also development actors and security actors need to somehow come together. And I'm talking more, more generally here. I think sitting in the World Bank, um, there is uh, or has been for over the last uh, five years, maybe 10 years, increasing recognition of the fact that, that, that we as a development bank focusing on ending, ending poverty and bringing uh, shared prosperity, basically our twin goals, we need to become more and more um, engaged in protracted conflicts um, because today it seems like, like uh, in many places, uh, it's not, if you compare historically, the World Bank was focused on post-conflict re recovery and reconstruction, um, uh, but that, that doesn't necessarily seem to be the case these days any, any, any longer in the same way at least. So you have some of that, but, but more to take a country like, like, uh, like Afghanistan, it's been since I've been in some type of conflict over, over many, many, many years. You look at Syria now, um, uh, and you look at so many other examples as well. Uh, so there is an re increasing recognition that you need to, we need to, um, work throughout this nexus of humanitarian development and security actors and see where those linkages are can be made more more uh, uh, in a, or in a more systematic manner so to make sure that we as a development bank and other development actors as well do not act only in our silo but we work and and and, and talk to and engage with uh, you know the ICRC UNICEF and other uh, humanitarian actors um, and, and in, in turn also where sometimes might be needed to, to speak to security actors. And, and I'd like to mention that the World Bank has a, a, a something called the Fragility, Conflict and Violence Strategy, uh, which was launched uh, uh, the year before last, um, which actually provides uh, sort of a, a menu of options and a, an approach um, recognizing that in, in, in increasing numbers, our projects will be in fragile uh, contexts uh, going forward. I mean, unfortunately, but that's the world we're living in. And if we're going to address, address uh, poverty reduction um, and bringing prosperity to, to people um, and, and supporting economic growth, that has to be uh, also in, in, in situations characterized by, uh, by conflict. Unfortunately, but that's, that's, that's what we do. And, and in, in that sense, we do have the opportunity to do that through through this strategy. So those are some of my thoughts, just listening to it. Really fascinating um, presentations. And, and Sharon, it was really interesting to hear uh, someone taking this really long perspective, you know, not only one or two years, as you said in the beginning uh, of, of evaluation, but 20, 20 years after, or 25 even, I think you said, uh, going back to the people that, 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 that's been engaged on all, on all sides. So, and, and I think that's, that's, 
much more powerful than just looking one or two years after, uh, because it really speaks to uh, you know whether this the, this this works or or, uh, uh, or or not. So, but and I, and I was uh, I was overall encouraged to hear uh, here even if people moved out of working specifically on this, they still maintain some of that um, uh, sort of connection, uh, if you like, uh, that that I heard coming through. So. Um, so, so really interesting that I'd, I'd like to highlight also from my, my, my own and experience and, and, the, and, the, and the bank's work. Uh, and I'm going to hi highlight particularly one example, the Nile, Nile Basin. So I'm, I'm, I'm the transboundary waters focal point at the, at the World Bank. And the World Bank's been engaged uh, over decades in, uh, in, in transboundary waters, supporting uh, sort of technical work and, and development along those lines. But of course, recognizing that that in itself contributes to, uh, uh, to, uh, to peace building, to stability uh, and conflict prevention um, uh, along, along the way. Um, and as such, as a tool to support development and, 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 and poverty reduction. If you, if you go back, I don't know, 20, 25 years in the Nile Basin, um, the, 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 the people uh, of, the con of the countries uh, that worked on water, they, they could barely be in the same room uh, and they didn't, they didn't want to uh, have dialogue on the, this shared resource that the Nile is. It's shared by 10 countries. Uh, but they, uh, they decided to come together um, about 20 plus years ago uh, and, and requested that the World Bank came in and supported them and, and building a program for, for, uh, for um, uh, finding a way for how they can collaborate more closely over this shared resource to make sure that uh, perhaps they could move away from a, a thinking where they only looked at the resource as, uh, as something that's, you know, this zero sum thinking, what, what, what I will gain is, by definition, someone else's loss, but really enlarging the perspectives and, and thinking about this as a shared resource that if jointly managed, um, you can achieve more than, than if, you, if, if each, and, each and, uh, and every one of the countries would manage it and, 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 and undertake their, uh, their work uh, unilaterally. And that has been going on um, over the last uh, 20 years or so uh, with World Bank uh, support, but really driven by by the countries, and of course, the World Bank uh, is supported by development partners that has really, uh, you know, put their put their their funds to this uh, perspective. And all, you you will all be aware that um, the situation on the Nile is not, uh, you know, all it's not all rosy and 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 and, and perfect in any way. Uh, but but when I hear those saying that, well, what, what have you really done uh, over the last 20 years or so? Can we see uh, any any development in terms of, of uh, improved cooperation, etc.? Uh, I'd like to see the, the glass as, as half full, recognizing the fact that, um, and this was also mentioned that in, in some of the other sessions, that moving moving the needle on, on, on cooperation and using environment for it is something that's a process. It's often, you know, Two steps forward, one step back, and, and sometimes one step forward and two steps back, um, and 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 that's that you need to have in, in as a perspective as you engage. And this is this is the World Bank perspective. But if we engage, we do it with a long term perspective. We, I, you know, I I don't like to think about even though a project may be three to five years. That's you know, if you engage, you need to do that with sort of at least for a decade and, and even more if you want to see sort of the fruits, potential fruits of, of cooperation uh, going forward. And I think that's what, what, what we have seen, uh, still a lot to be done in that, in that respect, um, but, but a movement towards that, um, uh, that goal of, of reducing poverty, um, achieving uh, prosperity and, and, and growth through coming together, utilizing the shared water resources. It's, it's something that, that sort of takes time and you need to, this type of process, uh, process um, uh, thinking. So those, those are some of my first reflections and, 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 and uh, you know, I'd, like, I'd love to hear from, from the panelists, uh, but also some of my, my own experiences um, uh, working um, as the Transboundary Waters Focal Point at, at, at the World Bank. Handing it back to you, David. Anders, I think you raise a really good point about the relationship between short-term crisis response 
versus long-term development. And I think that connects back to Sharon's presentation, which is the difference between a six month retrospective study on Jordanian, Palestinian and Israeli students or professionals coming together versus a 25 year retrospective study. Um, I think that we can draw this, this line between the four presentations and that you have these protracted conflicts around the world that are incredibly complex, that are situation specific. And as you said at the start, there's not a one size fit all solution. Um, we were supposed to have a fifth panelist, Mohammed Shaib Ahmadzi. Uh, unfortunately, he's having connection issues with his Wi-Fi. He's currently in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. Um, I've been connecting with him over the past couple of weeks and uh, the internet has been off and on. So we're going to continue with this session. Um, thanks to Harriet, I have a list of nine questions uh, that have been asked up to this point. Uh, the first, I'd like to turn to Sharon. Um, this was asked at the start. I assume your program only takes people who volunteer for it. Does your program select only those who are predisposed to, pre to peace building? And is there any role for a program like the Arava Institute to educate decision makers or politicians or those who may not otherwise volunteer? Wouldn't we all love to uh, require our politicians to go through certain courses that we choose? That would be an amazing world. Um, I, I'm, I love that, <laughs> that thought even. And in fact, we did have that thought. Um, I, I no longer work at the Arva Institute, but I can say that like any other academic institution for higher education, it is voluntary as, as was asked in the question. Uh, students apply and, and register. Um, what I can say is that the students registering are generally not peace activists, uh, particularly not from Jordan and from Palestine, but rather students who see an opportunity to use this as a, uh, what do you call it, a uh, um, trampoline, a springboard uh, by studying in English uh, to get into higher education programs elsewhere in the world. And in fact, that is something that happens not infrequently, that by providing a transcript that shows that they were capable of doing good academic work and getting recommendations from people whose work is recognized. Some of you may have been at the twin uh, presentation earlier about transboundary water. Uh, uh, one of the teachers uh, was one of the presenters. So if he writes a student a recommendation and is well known in the field, that student has a better opportunity of getting into uh, higher education somewhere else. Um, and generally, these are people who want to stay in the region, but they want to gain that leg up uh, in a very, very competitive um, job market uh, for that kind of work, right? For, for, for academic work or for even professional work with that, with that kind of training. Uh, so the majority of this, uh, I can, I want to tell a story. <laughs> I, I think the, the message is conveyed better through, through regular stories, especially because I'm still collecting data and don't have like final results to, to share with you. Um, six years after completing the program, we had an Israeli student who was working at the Dead Sea on the Israeli side. Uh, with an organization that was looking at the phenomena of sinkholes, which are sudden appearances of sinkholes having to do with the imbalance between the salty water from the Dead Sea and the fresh water and then land can cave in and it's quite dangerous actually. And because the Dead Sea is a very important tourist uh, attraction, there's a whole region of, of hotels along the water and of course, they are concerned about either water seeping into their basements or a sinkhole taking out either the hotel or the beach that the hotel uh, uh, accesses. And his boss said to him, gosh, our work would be so much stronger if we had data from the other side of the Dead Sea. Well, the other side of the Dead Sea is similarly uh, split into a factory, like on the Israeli side, what the lower end, the southern end is a factory for minerals and salt, and the northern side is a tourist area with hotels. Uh, the alum of the Arava Institute said, what's the problem? 
I'll call my friend so-and-so, he'll figure out who we have to talk to and we'll get the data. And he did. He called someone who wasn't even in the same semester as him, but was someone who he had interacted at uh, alumni activities through the network of alumni and was able to have that person who did not work directly on the Dead Sea, but they could locate in their country. It's bigger than Israel, but still a small, <laughs> a small country. I, I feel uh, tiny compared to Afghanistan or Myanmar, but uh, they were able to locate the correct person and they were able to not only get data, but to actually hold, this was pre-Zoom, but a, a Skype meeting between the offices on both sides to share data in both directions in order for both teams to have better information to make plans and recommendations to their respective governments. So, you know, the payoff may come five, 10, 15 years later, but the fact is that these are people who have lived together. These are people who have created trust relationships that if I call you and ask for data, you trust that I am doing something positive with that data. And this is not a um, attempt to uh, use power over, but rather power with uh, each other. Um, that's one story. Another story that I want to share is um, a Jordanian woman who uh, continued in Israel after the program and pursued a, a, a higher degree in Israel at one of the Israeli universities, uh, returned to Jordan. And this is, I don't know how many people know the context, but this is very not acceptable in the society. Although the Jordanian government as part of the peace treaty committed to recognizing degrees earned in Israel. So this, the, there are the professional organizations and unions and associations that can ban you if you studied in Israel. And this means that you don't have a pension plan. It means you might not have insurance for you and your family. Like there are sanctions. The, the Middle Eastern students, the, the Arabic speaking Middle Eastern students from Jordan and Palestine are truly taking large risks that impact their life, not so much in the direct sense of someone will kill them, but in the direct sense of having a financial and professional impact on what they can and can't do in the future. But this woman went back and ended up being hired by one of the international universities, uh, not the, the university is an American university that runs international programs, one of which is based in Amman. And so she was able to add to their programming, the ability to bring students across to Israel and to the West Bank, because she had already experienced that and had no second thoughts about doing that. Not only that, but she knew professionals on this side that she could uh, ask to speak to the group and to you know, educate them on different subjects because of her experience in the program and the connections that she made with both the instructors and her peer group and also connections through the alumni network. So these, these exam, and not only that, she also mentions in the interview that with American students, a very, central issue that comes up now is gender identity and inclusiveness. And in Jordan, there is very little awareness and what awareness there is, is kind of under the radar and not uh, expressed openly, but she is able to facilitate for those students because she ran into some of those issues in an international program where, where they were central as well. So there are other skills, not always exactly directly related to peace building in environmental peace building, but that these students are, are um, gaining that 15, 20 years later are still helpful to them. The networking, which is something that I find here in Impacts, where I can call somebody that I met at a conference in California two years ago and ask them if they can help direct me to material and they're genuinely inclined to help me succeed in whatever it is I'm trying to do and will do their best. I find that that is a, uh, an echo of what has been created in the experience of these students coming to this international program that allows them to form really deep relationships that they can depend on over time and also to trust the recommendations of the people that they know well about other people. So if somebody contacts me and asks me for something and I'm recommending a friend of mine, they're trusting me because 
they don't know that other person, but they, they trust that I know what they're getting at and what it is that they need in order to succeed in what they're doing. And so these kinds of, I, I have a million stories, I won't go on, but these are the kinds of stories I think that really show the strength of investing in our future. We are investing in the people who will become the government officials eventually. And some of them are starting to work in government agencies and then we can have the impact later. Are they self-selected? Yes, they have to be open to this kind of opportunity. We have had students from Palestine and Jordan who tell their parents that they are in Europe or tell their, their neighbors that they are in uh, Egypt. Um, you know, the, there's a, a lot of choices that are made about who you tell and when you tell them, what you reveal and what you don't. Um, but nonetheless, the, the network is working. The, the networking is working. Thank you. And those two anecdotes are just testament to the invaluable work that you do and your team does. Um, thank you for, uh, for sharing those. Um, I think it also ties in with what, what Anders said about transnational water cooperation and finding a common ground. Um, and sometimes you have to take one step backward to take two steps forward, albeit a long and winding road. I'd like to turn now, please, to a question uh, by Fran Cabrera. Um, if you are still on the session, you can feel free to ask. Otherwise, I can, I can read out your question. I'll ask uh, on behalf of Fran. This is for Elizabeth. Um, is there any technical support in Afghanistan uh, for the legalization of uh, poppy harvesting and poppy farming um, such that they could work together with local pharmaceutical or international pharmaceutical companies uh, and process it in the same way that pistachios and, and other, uh, other goods are? Thanks, David. Um, let me just say first, I have very limited information now. I do not contact anyone, including relatives in Afghanistan. It, it's just too dangerous. Um, so what I really, the information I get is through other um, sources who are outside the country. I do know there was, a, I think, a German pharmaceutical that was um, attempting to do something in Afghanistan with um, uh, pharmaceuticals and opium, but I really honestly can't can't speak to that because just the lack of information since the Taliban takeover is um, kind of devastating in, in terms of understanding what's happening right now. So um, yeah, that, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you for the honesty. Um, this is a question for uh, Dr. Kim. Do you see space for environmental conservation as a possible entry point for cooperation between the NUG and the KNU? and other care and actors that supported the park. In particular is the NUG in their attempts to develop policies for other natural resource governance. Has there been any discussion about this? Yes, as far as I know, there had, so NUG is the National Unity Government. So that's a exile government formed uh, by the elected representatives in Myanmar. So, so the, this, uh, the NUG government tried to uh, yeah, so they they have a high level of support and and the, uh, you can say that they have a high level of legitimacy from from the people. Uh, but at the same time, I think their relationships with the yeah there's no state armed actors, uh, ethnic armed organizations we call it in Myanmar. They it's very uh, contentious. So they they don't have a fully. Uh, uh, Open cooperation, right? So they, so at, at the KNU and and the NUG have they they have a very uh, substantial cooperation, and and uh, yeah, of course it's a it's it's difficult to verify, but they have also military support, um, also humanitarian support has been facilitated. So I think a lot of cooperation is happening, uh, but yeah, so NUG has very progressive natural natural resource and also climate change related policies. So they have also issued a report uh, in, uh, ahead of a COP 20, uh, 26 that the climate adaptation is lagging in the country. So I think they the NUG knows the importance of inclusiveness and also the equity in natural resource governance. But I don't think the Salmon Peace Park has been um, much discussed 
and but I, I don't I don't think there is much uh, discussion when it comes I don't think there is need for like a negotiation they're they're, they're on the same side I I would think so yeah I, I, well, I hope that will answer your question and I, yeah the, I, so I, I can maybe just jump to Narek's question uh, yeah so that's that's an excellent um question and i think it's yeah it's it's uh, it's actually a pretty long story how this tripartite cooperation between communities and rebel group and the environmental activists had emerged so it, this is a very long standing cooperation between uh, especially the KNU's uh, 5th brigade and the Karen uh, environmental and social action network they're called Kisan and the the current population living in the Peace Park area. So they have a long-standing cooperation because uh, largely they share the identity, the ethnic identity, they share the uh, history, they also share this identity that's very tied to tied to conflict uh, with the state. So, that, so they, they belong to the same social network. So I think the for them, the initial entry point uh, was through this uh, shared identity. But I think, um, yeah, so, so what, what actually started this whole cooperation was to edu educating uh, IDPs about the environmental issues and also forestation and forest management uh, about like 10 to 15 years ago. So the head of the uh, Karen environmental uh, NGO, he uh, is a refugee himself and he's from this community. So I think they have a very close link. And of course the KNU also, uh, have their soldiers recruited from the same population, right? So there's a very tight link between these actors. Uh, but yeah, so I should be careful here that I'm not saying that the KNU is controlling um, the environmentalists, that I, I truly don't think that's the case. I think they have their also autonomy and they have the decision-making power over what they focus, who they cooperate with. And I think they 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 have uh, some of the strategic points, right? So they they can gain access through this uh, cooper cooperating with the armed group, but also they they are not um, under their authority. I, I I can say so. Yeah, but yeah, this initial initiating the cooperation it took uh, a long period of time, and I think they also regularly talk. And yeah, they have a very uh, like close social uh, networks that's uh, overlapping in many aspects. Thanks, Dr. Kim. Last question, one minute, please, to Anders. Is there a moment in your career when the bank had to withdraw from a project because it was either too dangerous or there's too many, uh, there's there's too too much risk uh, in that project? And what were the reasons, uh, if so? Thank you for, for, for the question. So in my uh, in my experience where, where I've been working, that has not happened. Uh, but of course, the, the World Bank some, sometimes uh, steps back because it, it, it becomes either uh, impossible to work or um, there are other uh, uh, reasons uh, relating to, you know, who's the legitimate authority or the de facto authority, et cetera. Um, but other, other, other than that, um, you, you know, it might be other reasons um, uh, that we close projects such as, uh, you know, environmental reasons, uh, you know, one realizes that, that this, this will have uh, uh, negative effects that weren't foreseen, etc. So, uh, but generally speaking, that's, that's always studied before you actually start something that's um, uh, uh, that's going to affect, uh, especially when it affects uh, people, lots of environmental safeguards in place. So, uh, but really, I couldn't speak to the, the the detail of that question because I have not experienced it by, myself. All right. Well, to 29 people still here, I'd um, like to extend my deepest gratitude for you sticking through the hour and a half session. Really like to thank Anders, Kungmi, Sharon, and Elizabeth uh, for joining us at this session at the conference. We have a full day and a half left. Um, tomorrow, our sessions start very early in the morning. Thank you all for joining. Um, if you'd like to get in contact with any of the speakers, please uh, shoot us an email and uh, we'll, we'll connect you. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks for, uh, thanks thanks for uh, today. Bye-bye.